Uh, so now, good afternoon, everybody, again. And so we have quite a few material to cover. So I'll just jump into the uh, the module two, which will be chip seek alignment. Identifying enrichments, we will talk about ideas, how to identify enrichments, and we talk a little bit about visualization. And it will be strongly connected to the tutorial session which will be following. Uh, so certain slides which you will have in your, in your package, I will just skip them because we will either talk about them in tutorial or it's like your reference material because there are too many to cover in this hour and a half, but I still decided to keep them for you too to have them. And so I hope you all can hear me and see me. Oh, so I can, yeah. So. All right, so is it better? Yeah, yes. probably it's better. OK, so that's the learning objective of this module is to <coughs> basically understand how alignment works for the uh, short, uh, short uh, sequences. Uh, sequence of files which we obtained in in the in our experiment in chipseq experiment so many parts uh, of this module will be actually common if we talk about whole genome sequencing or all other next generation sequencing experiment but there are some specific features for chipseq which uh, which we will cover um, we'll talk about files alignment files the standards and then uh, discuss computational tools, how to analyze uh, enrichment. And what is enrichment, actually? That's a, actually a key question. What is enrichment? So the outline here, I'm not going to read it for you. Just let's jump into the, <coughs> into the next slide. And the next slide is basically a graphical summary. And I've stolen it from, this is a URL there, and, and, and a little bit annotated it. And the upper part was already discussed by Martin. So how we arrive to this stage when we have those short reads? And what will be the next logical step? The next logical step would be to find what part of the genome these reads come, um, and also whether we have recurrence. If we have just one read, we have many, many reads we sequenced, but then in the location A, we just have one read. It's probably not interesting for us. But when we see locations where we have a stack of many, many reads, then it's interesting. Then it's, it means that in many cells, we sequence the same molecule coming from different cells. And it means that something is specific for this particular region of genome. Um, and we would like to know. So the first step is alignment. And alignment, this is again a graphic, uh, graphical uh, presentation of, of uh, alignment process. And the alignment process will contain several components. What, we, what do we need to have in order to know where our reads are? First of all, we need genomic sequence. And this is the reference genome. And we will talk about reference genome and look into the reference genome when we do our tutorial. But that's basically a string of A, C, G, and T. Uh, then we will have fast file, fast, uh, fast uh, FASTQ file, and you're already familiar with these files and formats. We just, just worked a lot with this. And then we have a black box, which is short read alignment. And the only thing which in our uh, disposal there is parameters. What parameters we can control when we do alignment, and we talk a little bit about that. And then we'll have alignment file. And this is very important because we have standard for this alignment files. And currently, whoever writes new aligner or whoever works with, with uh, alignment files for next generation sequencing using this format, that's rather convenient. This format is evolving a little bit, but it is, it is still, it has enough flexibility to absorb new features if people want to come up with new features, but keep standard. And then there is analysis, of course. Uh, I will mention something to you which we are not going to discuss in this course. It's not very relevant for ChIP-seq or epigenetics analysis, although it's possible. So what is the alternative to alignment? And it's, it's, written, it's written as a header of this, uh, this slide. We can do assembly. So instead of having reference genome, 
we have a bunch of reads in our fastq file and we can try to stitch them together without using any reference to use de novo assembly so if we have a good chunk of, D, of, of DNA which we pulled out in ChIP-seq, it also makes sense. We can assemble a small contig, which will be covering region, for example, HCK27ME3, which is extended region. We can, technically speaking, we can also do it. But this is not a common practice. However, I would like to mention to you, this is a very, very active area of research. There are many assemblers and people, people do this as well. So now, reference genome, it's in a FASTA, it's a FASTA file. What is the main feature of a FASTA file? That we can have name for every contig, so it's organized as a collection of contigs. We, ha we can have name, and then we have sequence. And name is important because the whole coordinate system will be referencing to the name. And the name for us is chromosome name. Chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome X, and then there is you will see in the modern references, like uh, the genome, as NCBI provides us with a, with a reference genome, there is lots of unplaced chunks. And they are real pain when we try to do downstream analysis because many tools don't recognize those names. Many tools break with those names. And they are important because they, they contain genes and they, it's real sequences. The only thing that our modern assembly uh, knowledge doesn't allow us to place them properly in chromosomes. We know that there are only, only this many. There's only 24 chromosomes, but we don't know where to put them. Uh, what is, when you look at the genome, you mostly see A, C, G, T letters, but they're sometimes Ns. And we shouldn't take those Ns literally, because if we see the stretch of Ns, which is like 200 Ns, it was probably approximately from cytogenetics people see that maybe the size of this gap is about, well, maybe, of course, not 200 bases, but 2 megabase. And then they put 2 megabase of ends. But it's very approximate. However, those ends are very important because if we have more ends, then all our coordinate system will be shifted. And that's why when we use genome, we have to pay attention what build we are using. So if somebody gave us alignment to say AG18, the previous version of, of the human genome, the previous build. And then we try to visualize it at AG19 or, uh, or place those reads on AG19, we will get completely different coordinates. So we have to be aware about this. And then uh, this I learned hard, hard time that apparently even AG19 genome, genome which was uh, originated from 2009, it, which is much more very, very common in the literature, in all publications, people mostly using this genome. Uh, there's three locations, and there's three billion positions in the human genome. And there's three locations where we don't have, we have letters which are not ACGT. So if you, so I did just discovered it because I wrote a tool which only assumed that there's this four letters plus N, and this tool broke. So it was it was, sending, it was giving me an error. And that's because there is this uh, UEPAC characters. You know that there is a code which, for example, codes for A or C, C and G, this uh, re um, um, redundant uh, characters. Um, so this is like just example for you what are sizes of genomes we're working with. And of course, uh, mammalian genomes is several gigs, typically. Human genome is a little bit longer than mouse genome. And then we have the whole range. Plants have very long genome, very large genome. The Norwegian spruce is uh, 20 gig. And yeah, we go down to very short genome up to several kilobase for viruses. And yeah, I gave you, I gave you an example where you can find those genome sizes. So any questions so far? So genome is quite important. We, sh we should really pay attention what genome we are using. So sometimes experiment was done for human. People try to align to mouse. And for sure, many reads will align. Alignment rate will be low, but it still will be not zero because we have a good synteny between uh, two genomes. But that's, that happens. Um, <coughs> So now we are coming to the second block. You remember the first was on top, was reference genome, and then we're coming to the second block, which is, al uh, which is aligner. And the two major classes of short read aligners, 
Short data aligners is a special industry. It's different from Sanger sequences aligners. It's a very specific type of aligners. And it's more or less like string matching. Because reads are relatively short, we can find an exact match on the genome. Right? It's like word finding. You have a dictionary, our, our reference, and we find where in this dictionary um, our sequence happening. And that suggests how aligners are built. There are two major classes. One is built on hash tables. So what, what, what does it mean? We take reference, for example, we take reference, and we know that our reads will be longer, but about like 50 bases. Then we shred our reference in, say, 30 bases. We take every possible 30 mer in the human genome, and then write location where it happens. Some 30 mers happen in a couple of locations, some in many, some in unique. But then we have a table. We have a sequence and location, sequence and location, sequence and location. So what our align, how our alignment will look, look like when we have a fast queue files, which you discussed, uh, we discussed in, uh, with Martin, uh, how, how we will find, how we will do alignment. It's a very simple process. We just look up in this table. We have a sequence, right? And we just look. We have a huge table. We look where is the sequence. We found the sequence. And then in this table, we have key and value. And our value is location, position. So that we, that's very simple. Well, it's, of course, computationally rather involved because we have to traverse huge table, right? Because like, we have four, four possible letters in every position of the human genome. Then if we have dinucleotide, we have 16 different dinucleotides. If we have three nucleotides, we have four to the power three. And then if we have 30, we will have four to the power 30, which is pretty big dictionary to traverse, OK? So this is based on hash table. And then people relatively recent, it's around 2008, people found a transformation which compactify the search space. Our search space is much smaller. But this transformation is completely reversible. So although we compress our sequence space, but we can come back to the real sequence space. And of course, Burroughs will build this transformation. And there are some aligners built uh, on this paradigm. And it's called suffix. It uses suffix or pre prefix trees. Uh, these aligners are faster. They're memory efficient, but they're a little bit less sensitive. So I, I put here, it's rather involved, but it is review written by authors of aligners. So they know what they're talking about. And this is a good detailed review about all guts of uh, next generation sequencing short read alignment. So you can look at it. But for us, for now, we have to basically have this concept of having hashes of short sequences and look up for those. That's how, how aligners are looking, uh, how aligners are built. Of course, there is some caveats to this. We have uh, mistakes. When we sequence short reads, we, sometimes we have a wrong base. And this would be sad if in our 75 base read, read with one base when we have wrong, uh, wrong letter to, draw, to just say, well, let's drop it. So that's why alignments, short read line, aligners typically allow for mismatch. So we look at this 30 bases at the beginning of the read, but we allow for mismatch to happen, one or two. If it's more than two, you, it's you, for you to decide how many mismatches you allow. So here is comparison of aligner on execution time. Because of course, if you have especially quite a few data sets to analyze, you will be considering how long will it take to align, align my, my FASTQ file. And uh, that's, that's an example. <coughs> and. Um, from, from this paper, it's basically, we, we don't know exactly how many reads they align, but that's not our point. It's linear. Obviously, our aligner will be linear in, this, in the size of our fast queue. That's why what would be the, if you have very, very large data set, how would you align it faster? What would be your idea? How to align large fast queue file? Well, you go for the fastest one. You go for the fastest aligner, and it's still too slow. What to do? You don't know about chromosomes yet. You just have your, your reads. But 
you 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 your point you have a very good point you just cut your file into small files and do it in parallel so you can you can of course do it but here we have comparison for one particular fast queue and you can see that this red aligners which are based on the transformation they're faster than the aligners which are based on hash tables and they're about order of magnitude faster which is very very important for us and in the old days we used mac aligner and of course we have to wait several days even with very very small data sets at this time typical chip seek experiment was three billion reads which is 10 or 100 times less than current chip seek experiments but we still had to wait a long time so now we're using yes are all of these aligners based on the same algorithm? No, they all they all based. They written by different people. They based on slightly different. They so globally, if I come back, they, there are two classes based on hash tables or based. <coughs> on, green will be always based on hash tables and based on suffix or prefix trees. But all those aligners, they're heuristic. They didn't give you optimal solution. They gave you always approximate solution for this particular set of reads. They didn't find you absolutely optimal. So this heuristics is individual for every aligner. And then, of course, implementation. They use different languages, different computer, computer languages, etc. Of course, most of good aligners use C, which is the fastest. And so that was a speed. And as a speed is pretty good for this BWA, that's the aligner we will be using later. And that's the aligner we use at Genome Sciences Center in Vancouver and in the production and this study. Well, so now what is the second? Of course, speed is not everything. What else? What else we would be interested? In? How accurate our aligner is, and how how sensitive is our aligner is. So, so one thing is how many reads from our fast queue is placed somewhere on genome. That's first question. But then also the second question: out of those which are placed, how many are placed correctly? And this is in principle. For aligners, it's a very clear-cut question. It's a very definitive question to ask, and we know how to, how to answer this question. It's a pretty easy task to do. It's laborious, but pretty easy. How would you do it? How would you answer this question if somebody gave you an aligner? Making a simulated Exactly. So you take a genome, you shred your genome into those reads, and you can just choose million arbitrary locations, or you just meticulously shred every single position, and then feed this fast queue into your aligners and to see how many are aligned correctly and how many are not aligned correctly. And that's what was done. And here you have a table. And you can see that some aligners are, uh, for example, let's look at the, um, let's look at the mark. You know, this was relatively slow. So the green was slow aligners, right? Fast was faster aligners. So it has, very high percentage of read aligned, but properly aligned, only half of them. Of course, we, we wouldn't be happy with this type of aligner because we would do many, many discoveries with not properly aligned reads, especially if there is some systematic bias in this aligner. It's erroneously aligned in the same and the same spot. Then we will have concordance between different experiments, etc., and it all will be spurious. So we don't want it. So again, the, our choice would be BWA. Oops. BWA, which has relatively high alignment rate, alignability rate, and relatively high uh, sensitive, uh, specificity. So it's properly, quite a few of them are properly aligned. And it's fast. Well, why would you not choose bow tie too? If it's high uh, you can, alignment? yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very similar principle, and it's it just, yeah, just your choice. Bow tie too, nothing wrong with it. You can use it. Yeah. Yes. So, if I have a fast Q, fast Q file and I align it and the alignment percentage is 80% or 78%, yes. what, like, so if it's less than what percent I can say that my data work don't have an accurate depth? Um, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking, like, is 80% is good or, good or not? Um, well, there is no universal answer on this question. And I think maybe Martin mentioned, I, I don't remember him mentioning, but in the first chip seek experiment, the alignment rate was ridiculously low. It was like 10%, 15%. And 
and it was like pioneering experiments. But we had to accept the fact that the sequencing platform was not good. Yeah. So we were losing a lot of reads, but there's still some useful reads. So nowadays, of course, if you are somewhere below 80%, that's, let's take your number, you should worry a little bit. You should look at those reads which are not aligned. Of course, whether it's good or not, you will see only after analyzing your data. I mean, first of all, there is an absolute number. You know the length of your genome. If you work with C. elegans, you need less reads. If you work with human, you need more reads. And then you roughly can calculate your coverage. How we would calculate the coverage, uh, mean coverage, from if you have 80%, so we have a fast Q file with 20 million uh, reads, let's say single end reads. And we know that the read length is 75. And we know the length of the genome. We can calculate the mean coverage of the genome with, with our experiment. Right? It will be the read length times number of reads yeah. divided by the genome length. This will be mean coverage. Of course, that's not what happens in ChIP-seq because our reads have tendency to cluster in certain locations. For whole genome shotguns, this will be right estimate because it's relatively uniform. Or from DNA input, it will be right estimate because it's relatively uniform. So then you can judge. But of course, it's a very good question. What are those reads which are not aligned? And that's where QC uh, of your experiment uh, should be done, right? If you're really concerned, you should check, are they coming from contamination from other species? Maybe they're aligned to some, maybe there's bacterial genome. Or maybe you, your genome, if you work with mouse, maybe your mouse strain is different from the black six, which is reference mouse genome, and you have too many SNPs, which not allowing quite a few reads to be aligned. So maybe you choose your, you change your alignment parameters a little bit to extend your, uh, in, improve your alignability. But that is given. In a sense, at the end of the day, what you got, you got. It, quality of your experiment. Uh, but, in a, in a, but just to, in to ask your answer, I, I mean, I mentioned that, right? So if it's a recent histone mod uh, IP, it should be over 90% aligned. If you're below that, okay. it means you've got some problems. Yeah. Okay. You should look into it. Okay. So, for example, like if we, when we get data from like Gene of Quebec, the data we get get is aligned to a reference genome. Yeah. Suppose the our lab is using like newer version of the genome, say MM10, and Gene of Quebec gave us with MM9. If we if we have the data, then definitely there was some reads which were missed out, like not 100% aligned, which uh, Gene of Quebec gave us. Is it some way to track the reads from BAM file which were not aligned? Yeah, Misha's yeah. Gonna get, Misha will get into that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's in the cigar string and many yeah. other places as well. But yeah. yeah. Can, yes, so not aligned reads. And that's a good question also. Now, after alignment, something to mention for you. After alignment, there are different flavors or different decisions were taken by people who wrote those aligners. For example, some people, some aligners will not write in the alignment file those reads which will not align. Dump somewhere else or just forget about them. Some aligners will keep all reads. And it's a big difference, right, for us. Because multiple times we would like to come back and back and back to our original FASTQ files. And if our aligners doesn't keep all reads, it means we have to double the space needed to, uh, to store our data. Normal BAM file or some files, the alignment file, I, a little bit ahead of me, I didn't introduce uh, some file for you, but the alignment file, if it contain all reads, it should be recoverable. We should come back and recover all reads fast queue, which maybe I don't like this aligner anymore. I would like to use another aligner. So, but we will talk about this more. Um, so now, when I talk about choices of parameters for aligners, there are two key par there are many, par if you, if you, for any aligner, if you run it without no parameters, so you give a long list what you can choose. The same is BWA, and we will do it um, in our practicum. But the two key parameters, one is seed length. <coughs> Obviously, when we have a read length 75 bases, we don't want to require that the whole 75 bases are aligned, because this will be a waste of time. The longer, it's the concept of hash tables, right? the longer our reads Look up, read the huge, the, the larger will be, will be. So probably the this number is not doesn't exist in universe. If we have 75 base 
uh, per read is 4 to the power 75. This number doesn't exist. We will not be able to write this number on the whiteboard on anything. This is a very big number. But, uh, but uh, so we choose smaller number. And typical for WA align, it is 32 bases. Of course, if you read the shorter than 32 bases, then you see the shorter. But basically, that's the part of the read, typically at the beginning of the read, uh, to be used for aligner. And the question to you, why we choose at the beginning of the read? Why the seed is typically at the beginning of the read, or always at the beginning of the read? Exactly. That's where the quality is still good, and at the end it deteriorates, and we would like to. So what happens to the rest? There is different heuristics, and typically it uses optimal smith watermel algorithm to place the rest of the read. So now, uh, if we have human genome and we have random 20 mere, sometimes we can, random 20 mere can be, if we use blood, like the historical aligner, we can place it in a human genome. So if we above the 20 base pairs, it's our alignment that should be pretty good. So our seed length should be more than 20, equal or more than 20. So what is the second parameter? The second parameter is how many mismatches. And this, again, it depends on your sequencing quality. If your sequencing quality high, you probably shouldn't allow many mismatches, because then uh, you don't know what you're doing. You can misplace certain reads, or you can place reads which don't belong there. And you will have, what will happen with when we allow more and more mismatches? We will have more reads aligned, uh, multi-mapped. We will have reads aligned to position A and position B and position C because we allow many mismatches. So we would like to keep this number also in some kind of control. And typical number is two. Those are default. So that's a reference to the aligner which we are going to use. And now I will, I will go through this quickly, because we will kind of come back to those questions when we will be doing tutorial. So when we aligned in our file, we didn't introduce file yet, but what, we, what kind of classes, what classes of reads we expect? First, uniquely aligned. Those are good. And they should be, more than 90% of those should be, uh, of, of fast few reads should be uniquely aligned. Then it's unaligned reads. And this can be this can be anything. The reason for this can be anything, and that's for individual experiment. And in some experiment, we can expect we can expect some some fraction of unaligned reads. Uh, then, for pair and experiment, we have properly paired reads and not properly paired reads. So, properly paired reads uh, are those reads which are first of all within the expected fragment length. And Martin already introduced to you this fragment length distribution. And those distribution can be seen uh, not exactly the way they reconstructed from alignment, but uh, we typically can run some traces during the library construction step and to see what is the fragment length. So you, you get an idea what is your average fragment length, what is your maximum fragment length. So if you, so those pairs which have lengths maybe 1 million, probably they're not properly aligned. Unless you have something in your, in your, in your, in your, in your data, some structural variations, for example. So here I, I show you example of uh, fragment length distribution. And the first one is from syndicated data. And the second one is from native chip, MNA's digested data, which we already saw in Martin's presentation. And you can see in both of them, the blue one is both for K27 M3 mark histone modification, and the blue one is corresponding input. And although in syndicated data we don't see this uh, shorter, shorter fragments, but there is some trend that in uh, chip seq we have longer fragment lengths. And typically, what we have to remember that fragment lengths will have a long tail. So the majority, the mean. Of course, it's good. It tells us something. It's about 200 bases, but then we will have a long tail. Uh, so not properly paired. What else can be uh, with not, when the reads are not properly paired? What else can be? So we have pair of read. So for example, read 1 aligned on chromosome 1, and read 2 aligned on chromosome Y. That's 
probably some mistake. Unless, again, we looked, we collect all those and look at structural variation. Maybe we have a translocation. And that's how many tools which are looking at structural variations are working. And of course, if genome has some structural variations, we will see those type of problem in our chip seek data as well. So no. That's essentially what, what I just said. That there is, it could be deletion, inversion, and this in, or, or insertion, and this will all will be resulted in non-properly uh, paired reads. And last class of non-properly paired reads, when we have pair and experiment, when one read is aligned and the second is not aligned. This again can be many reasons for those, but you will have this class. Typically for cheap seek, we ignore those, but if there are very, very many of those, you can consider <coughs> keep them and think how to extend those reads and how to keep them. So now uh, we also uh, have, when we align, some of the reads will be duplicated. And we already learned about PCR duplicates. This was mostly libraries were dominated by PCRs. PCR duplicates in, in, the, in the past, uh, new Illumina platforms. There is also another source of duplication is optical dupli uh, duplication. So basically now the uh, adapters are seeded. They have specific location on the flow cell. And uh, when they're too close or, or we kind of misreading, we can, we're misreading one, we're confusing two reads, and then we will have optical duplicate. Uh, Again, if you have many, many, many duplicates in your library, that's a red flag, something to check. Uh, if the duplication rate is less than 10%, less than 5%, it's okay. So duplicated reads, you basically lose your reads. You, you have less reads. Because what we are doing with duplicated reads, we collapse them. If, and when we say duplicated, it can be also multiplicated, right? It can be 10 reads coming from the same, exactly same location. So now, what are duplicated reads? What will be characteristic of duplicated read, read or fragment after a line? First, let's talk about read. What is duplicated? If two reads are duplicated, how we will see in our alignment file? They have the same coordinate, yes. So reads will have the same coordinate, so it means they're, they're duplicated and they're stuck on top of each other. Now, what is our expectation? Can we expect, can they happen? Can that happen in, in principle? Yes. So if I go to the next, this slide, can we expect duplicated reads? And yes, if we have single end experiment and we'll have 50 base pair read and we have a stack higher than 50 bases, uh, 50x, 50x, 50 reads on top of each other, then of course at least one read will be duplicated. There is no room for the read to start, right? So we only have, if our read length is 50 bases, we only have 50 position to start. So if we have coverage higher than 50, in principle, we can have a duplicated, uh, duplicated uh, read. But on the other hand, now with uh, pair end experiment, uh, because we have a flexibility between two ends, we have a start of one end, one read and the start of another read, and the chances to have duplicated fragment are nearly zero in ChIP-seq experiment. So the current practice that we collapse those duplicated fragment or multiplicated fragment and just don't consider them. Well, why can't we use duplicated read as a increasing coverage? Because it gives you the same information, right? So it confirms whether what your first read is. It's a, you can, but it's, it's a bit dangerous because it gives you the same information, but like, first of all, it, it was just one molecule. Like biologically, it was one, one cell gave you, gave you this piece of DNA, but then you have duplicate and it say multiplicate 50 times. So imagine it was just a, just background. This molecule was noise. It was not properly specifically IP. Then it was PCR amplified. We have 50 copies of those. And then you'll have a nice tower, fantastically looking tower, like enrichment, but it's completely false because you don't have enrichment there. This is first. And then, for example, if we're looking at 
whole genome shotgun and we're calling uh, we are calling SNPs. This will be, and we have one mistake in this read. Then we will have wrong SNPs there again because we'll have enough coverage and we will have homozygous. Yeah. So this is a general comment: duplicates are removed or <coughs> missed from chip seek data for that reason, right? You're trying to estimate enrichment over background, so so they should be removed. I, I think Misha, I think you know, folks, you just give them what your advice is. And I mean, there's yeah. lots of caveats to all of this, but I think it's important for beginners to to, to recognize what the current state is, which is removal. Of Remove duplicates. duplicates yeah. Yes, but it's it's okay. We have we have all these questions. Yes. So a duplicate is literally from start to end the exact same sequence. That's right. Yes. Exact same coordinates. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and with sequence, there are some, there are some, uh, so the read sequence can be because it's it's PCR, right? It's prior to sequencing. We can have we can have sequencing error. So the sequence itself can be slightly, but there is very strict requirement <coughs> that sequence similarity is also high. Okay, and then the last class. Uh, so after duplicated reads, we can have reads which aligned in multiple locations. So basically, a liner struggles to assign unique locations. So it finds several locations. And those reads are coming from regions of genome which are repetitive, for example. So if read comes, it obviously, obviously it comes from one spot. But when we try to place it, we find a oh, perfect match here, perfect match 5KB away, etc. So in this case, BWA is arbitrary. Not randomly, which is which is not good. Arbitrary assigns assigns coordinate, and again, as a recommendation, in most chip seek experiments, we just ignore those. We don't consider those because we don't know where to place them. There are some uh, there are some exceptions to this, and if you talk, want to talk about this, we can talk l uh, later after how to deal with multiplication. For example, if you actually your experiment dealing with repeats, then there is some uh, some uh, approaches. So this multi-map treats, they, uh, typically we talk about mappability. So what happens that actually not uh, the entire genome, not entire mammalian genome is accessible for us. So when we have 75 base pair uh, long reads, only about from 90 to 80 or 80 to 90 percent, depends on chromosome of genome, is uniquely mappable. And the rest, unfortunately, we, we, we don't know what to do. Uh, so here is cartoon, why it happens. So you can see those uh, green reads. There. So the orange is repeats on the genome. So green reads are perfectly mapped, no problem. But then when we have reads coming from the, from the red, uh, red reads coming from the repeat, then when we try to align, they align here, and they also align here. We don't know how to place it. And uh, when we have parent information, it helps, because what can happen in parent experiments that one read aligned uniquely and one read aligned in the, uh, uh, aligned in the multiple, multiple locations, and then we can nail, uh, nail the second read using the parent um, lengths where actually it comes. That's how, how alignment works. Yes. Would it be worth to instead of looking for like seventy five or Illumina one hundred and fifty to like bigger fragments, three hundred, three hundred, or something? Uh, for the sequencing. It, it will it will increase your alignability for sure because like for what is what is the main main danger in human genome or in mammalian genome is this alu repeats right about three hundred bases. So if you have two reads in pair inside the repeats, that's it. Forget about it. Now. Uh, that's 300 bases is a typical, like 200 is typical fragment size. So now the longer, my understanding, and Martin can comment more, is that you have limitation in your library construction with Illumina. You can't really go beyond like 500, 600 bases. So it's very long. You, it doesn't bridge amplify. So. I thought you said we only match the first 20. Right. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. But now we are talking about read one, read two, two pairs. Okay. So we matched first 32 or 20, depends on what, in one location. We matched in another location. And it happens that second location was in repeat. 
So one read uniquely mapped. The second read is mapped in multiple, multiple places. And we see that one place is actually 500 bases away or 300 bases away from our uniquely mapped mate. And others are different chromosomes or different locations. And then alignment is smart enough to decide that the right location for the second read will be closest. So that's how, how it comes. So you're, you're probably going to get better understanding as you go through the module. All alignments are, are done single-ended. So the pairing is done after the fact. BWA in the seed length is 32 by default, two mismatches. Although Misha's showing you that there are other options, such as a smaller read length. The problem is, is that once you get past 100 base pairs, what's not mappable is KB in length. So going 200 or 300 or 400 or 500 isn't going to help resolve those guys. It asks, you know, you get to a plateau, and the incremental increase in mappability is yeah. very small as you get longer and longer and longer. And it is true on the Illumina platform, you're limited by 600 in terms of your cluster. That's just the nature of how the clusters are formed. And then also the read length because of the phasing, pre phasing problem. But, but you're going to go through the mapping. And yes, the in, the, in the practical, practical. Um, So maybe this is just. Are we good? Every, everybody is OK. So that's just an example for you um, that alignability or this mappability is different for different chromosomes. And it's kind of expected, right? We know that, for example, chromosome X and Y, they have lots of synteny between them. So if the reads coming from there, they, we, you can see here, this is first first two bars, the mappability is about 80%. But other chromosomes, and this is 75 base pair reads. And I've done here, it's a simulation exactly which we discussed. I just shredded genome in 200 bases, take 75 bases on both ends, and just use BWA to align, and see how many I will recover. And that's, so like about 10 to 20% of the genome will not, will not you, will, you will not prop. And we can e easily visualize this. And for example, you see C genome browser, which we talk later about it if you're not familiar. But if you're familiar, just search for <coughs> mappability tracks. There are pre calculated mappability tracks for different uh, read lengths. This is a single end. And they look like that. They show the number from 0 to 1. And when you see 1, it means this position is 100% mappable. When you see 0, there is no. Every read which will overlap this position will not be aligned uniquely. And typically, look at this screenshot. So there is a repeat. And in this case, it's uh, Earth, some LTR, this black, uh, black bar, and all <coughs> uh, read lengths, 50, 70, and 75, and 100, are not uniquely aligned there. So that's now maybe jumping a little bit, but just to give you some interesting interesting comment here, where it will matter, where this mappability, mappability will matter. When we have integrated analysis of several data sets, and our data sets have different read lengths. So one data, and it happens to us every, we want to, we have a new, new experiment, 100 base pairs with a new Illumina platform, and for uh, all the experiment, with 50 bases. And this is our wild type, and this is our new type, and we would like to compare. And one is 50 bases, and another is 100, 100 base pair long. And this would be a little bit dangerous, because mappability for 50 and 100 is different. You can see even from this screenshot, for example, this location. In 50, we have a big gap, but in 100, we have some coverage. So in 100 base pair experiment, we will recover this area. We will see coverage. In 50, not. And then when we compare to experiment, we will see, aha, uh -huh, there is differential, differential enrichment there, which will be completely due to mobility, which will be wrong. So that's, we have to remember this. Yes, you had a question? No? Oh, no? OK, I thought. All right, so let's move on, because uh, so I would like to skip this. And this is exactly those <laughs> green header. Uh, that we will talk a little bit in there, because I'm a little bit afraid that uh, sure, sure uh, we will not have enough time. So this is basically about some file and some format. So some file is uh, standard alignment uh, uh, mapping uh, format. It has 10, sorry, not 10. It has 11 obligatory fields and then some optional, optional fields. And basically question to you, what this alignment file should contain? 
what is absolutely necessary to know when we have an alignment? Coordinate. What else? Yeah, that's coordinate. Quality, quality of alignment, <coughs> mismatches, whether there was mismatches, not mismatches, what part of the read was aligned. For example, sometimes some alignments they say, sorry, I can't align this first 10 bases. I soft clip them, I kind of mask them and start from base 10. So th this type of information is contained and we will go through in, in the practice. So <coughs> I, will, I will skip, uh, skip this. Maybe comment a little bit here. So now we have a single single end uh, experiment, and there's still quite a lot of data which was which is still useful and in public repositories which you would like to use on its single end. So now when we have a cheap seek, so let's say, and let's talk now about transcription factor uh, DNA binding experiment, and say this is DNA and this is a binding site transcription factor binding site. So now, our fragments will be covering the spot. If our antibody is specific, we, we, we pull this type of fragments. But we sequence these uh, fragments from one end, from single end. So this will be our read here, this will be our read here, positive strand, negative strand, positive strand, positive strand. So now, if we only take the read and profile, like drop them on, on the genome, what, will, what picture we will have? We will have something here, some tower here from this read, and one read here. This is not what we want, right? So intuitively, we would like to profile the entire fragment, because if we profile those four fragments, what will be our picture? Our picture look completely different. It looks something like this with the maximum sitting in the actual binding site. So now, but we only have single single end. So the typical practice uh, is to extend this read with the average fragment length. And that's what I'm explaining here. So we just take the starting coordinate. We know that our average fra from the library construction, we know that our average fragment length is, say, 200 bases, and we extend it. And the caveat here is that we have to remember about uh, start and end. So basically, just remember that positive strand and negative strand are slightly different creatures. So the, for the negative strand, coordinate given for the start of the read. But we have to extend from the end of the read. And this is something just maybe just try to remember. OK. Cigar, everything. So something you can you can play with. So some questions. I put some questions about cigar. We talk about this. So now, uh, after we have this some file, uh, alignment file, we need some tools to an analyze this an alignment file. And uh, some tools are very very popular. Maybe some of you are familiar. Maybe please raise your hand if you know if you heard about some tools. Who heard about some tools? Quite a few. So that's great. So some tools is very useful. Uh, they are well tested. The entire community is using them. And uh, we can really do a lot with having our alignment, alignment file in some tools. So it's indexing. We can use, use in for indexing. We can review it. And we can also grab statistics and do quite a few things. Now, there is a brother or cousin of uh, some file called BAM file which is actually binary, binary file. And uh, this binary file helps us to save space without losing any information. So we can convert using some tools. We can con convert ASCII file into, into BOM file. Um, so now uh, we will do this practically during the tutorial session. But uh, we have, after alignment, we also have to mark duplicates as a separate task. Aligner by itself doesn't know. And there are multiple tools to do this now. We will be using Picard. Uh, there is another one which I tried and recently, and actually uh, in the at Genome Sciences Center in its production, it's move, uh, they're moving uh, to the SAM Bamba. And I tried it, and it's a very good tool. Actually, it's fast. And, um, the point is that we have to 
mark duplicates after we have uh, after we have our BAM file and the separate step. The separate the steps of sorting. We'll go through them. Now I have a, a question to you about yes. In Gypsy, do you have any polyphony uh, trimming step at the beginning? Yes. If, if there is some duplicates, but one is, for example, there is one ring that has a base pair that is trimmed, do you consider it as duplicates? Yes. So, so there is, uh, so generally speaking, easily there is alignment coordinates. So chromosome one, base 1000. And another with chromosome one base by one thousand, uh, it will be considered as duplicate. Yes. Even if the, the base pair is removed by the um, I have to look up. There's certain criteria how many mismatches you allow when you consider those molecules are different, but it's pretty loose. So you need reads to be, but then it's not aligned, almost not aligned. So rule of thumb, if they align to the same coordinates, they they consider it to be duplicate. And this will be filtered not by quality, but filtered by duplication flag. So by running this mark duplicate, we will set a flag, which is position two, field two in a sum file, which will indicate to us that this read is duplicated. And so it's, it's flag 11, so we should, we, should use some, we should use flag filtering, and we will be doing this in, in our practice. So now, um, the qu sorry, just let me answer the question about quality. What we will do with quality, we will do also quality filtering. And by doing quality filtering, we will remove those multi mapped reads. Because the quality, alignment quality, will tell us how well alignment can find the place for this read on the genome. And if uh, it finds a place here in one location, and it's nearly with the same accuracy it can find in another location, then the quality will be low. Of course, this location can have mismatch, then the quality, if it's identical in both locations with no mismatches, then quality of alignment qualities, that's what Martin said, there is a read quality and then alignment quality. Alignment quality is zero. Alignment quality in BWA is a number from zero to 82, something like that. So it's zero, and then if it's nearly nearly multi mapped so it's aligned in one position with no mismatches, another position with mismatch, then it will be quality one or two, etc. So typical threshold is five. When your quality, read quality threshold is five, then you, then you basically resolve your locations pretty well. Just one sec, he had a question. Then. So once we are like putting some flags on duplicated reads, suppose then after that we are converting Converting the file to a bad file, bad format. Uh -huh. Will the bad format file will, will contain the duplicated reads or not? Uh, well, of course, bad format doesn't doesn't have uh, information. No, standard the answer, quick answer is no. Okay, then instead of just marking duplicates, is it a good way to remove duplicates? Mm, if you ask me, that's personal, very personal view. No, because you're losing your information. Yeah, but we are looking here for the enrichment. We are not looking for any. So, in the statistical analysis, also, like support your. Oh, it's it's a it's a personal preference. Okay. You either remove it and forget about this, or you remember at every analysis step put a flag. Mm -hmm. Just don't take collapse duplicated reads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I was asking. If uh, we are putting flag, that means the other software like. If I'm using whatever software. But you know, it's I'm so sorry for there. I, I think why would you convert alignment file into the bad file? It's kind of uh, typically bad files uh, used for already some features, right? So it's not like it will be huge bad file. Yeah. Okay. So let's go in another. Let's suppose I want to calculate the read counts and map it to transcripts or genes. Yes. Then, if I am using R or <coughs> some other tool for that, will you like to consider the flags by bigger tools? Typically, yes. Then, then of course, you already filter. You collapse your multiplicated or duplicated reads and your bad number. So, bad file. We didn't talk about bad format, but I, I'm going to talk. So, everybody, or most of you, know what bad format is. Bad file. So, it's basically chromosome start and and some number 
some float number giving you a score. So it's a very simple. So it's in, in this position of the genome, we have this float number. And it could be coverage of the exon, or it could be a signal of uh, ChIP-seq experiment in a TSS of the gene. It could be anything. So yes, for those, but that's not the read file, right? We don't, we lose primary information about reads. So. Uh, my question was a bit similar, I guess. Okay. Uh, why don't we um, mark the duplicates before the alignment that would save quite a bit of uh, it will it will but that's uh, it it will and uh, except the fact that uh, the mismatches and sequence quality right so the sequence itself so what you're suggesting is but also like how would you do it you have this file with 100 million reads so you kind of have to sort through this file and find those sequences which are identical. It's quite a computational involved step. So but du duplicates are discovered by alignment. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so now, uh, where else we can use Picard or Samba Bamba? Now, a typical, our typical, ex one of the flavors, good or good practice, to do a chip seek experiment to multiplex. So we have several lanes, we have the same reagent, but we place certain pieces in different lanes. Then we avoid some biases, right? We avoid batch effects and stuff like this. So in this case, uh, we have for one histone, one antibody, one histone mode, we have several alignment files. They're coming from different lanes. We run mark duplicates, and then we would like to merge them. So we use, we use uh, merge some files in Picard, or there is a merge option in Samba Bamba. So we need to merge them together. And now the question to you, will it be good if I mark duplicate in every individual, uh, individual lane, then merge them, or I'm, am I ready to do my analysis, or I do something else? I have to do something. Just let's think about, a little bit about this, what happened. So I have this, the same reagent, loaded in different lanes, I sequence them, I have my fast Q files coming from, from different, uh, different lanes. Of course, I can uh, uh, cut those files together and align, but as we talked before, maybe from the speed, speed up of my process, I will align them in parallel. I mark duplicates, I merge them. Everything done correctly? Yes. You need to mark duplicates again? Again, of course. Because what can happen is that different duplicated reads ended up in different lanes. So just just a word of caution. So now visualization and the different and it's person specific. I, I like UCSC maybe because UC, UCSC was around for quite many years and it's very customizable although sometimes it's slow. Hopefully it's not going to be slow when we are doing our practical today. Uh, we can use uh, WashU. There is WashU epigenomic browser, which is very, very, it has lots of functionality, but it's very involved. It's kind of advanced usage. Or you can use uh, IGV. Both UCAC and IGV allow you to uh, look at the reads, at the read level, or at the level of uh, coverage profiles. And coverage profiles will look like this. So here is an, I put an example for you. That's for H1, and this is exactly the set we are going to work with. So it's H, H1, six histone modifications for H1 uh, human embryonic cells. And here is input. Here there is two transcription factors, tracks for the same H1, and here is RNA-seq. So you basically, that's very visual, right? We, that's what we were discussing there, that we would like to to drop those reads and to see where they collapse in the same location, where they're stuck on top of each other. They're not going to stack exactly, but they will, fortunately for places where they should, they will create these little towers and we can look at. Now, there is a notion, the people call them peaks. Of course, generally speaking, when we talk about histone modifications, some of them are extended regions, not, not just peaks. So I prefer to call them enriched regions. So that's a bad format, and we already talked a little bit about bad format. There is one thing to remember about the bad format. 
In most cases, it doesn't play any role, but in some cases, it's important, and I've been there many, many times, uh, that it is zero-based. So when we have a bad file, we have chromosome start end, but the actual start is not the genomic start. It's one base less. Just, it's not necessary. I don't want you to understand this completely, and nobody understands why authors chosen this, because it's very non-intuitive. So the end is exactly where, where the region we are describing is, but the start is one base less. But that's something to remember, and it can create some problems. Then the second popular format is Vigil, Vigil file format, and we will generate this format in, in practice. Well, a little bit more complicated, but we'll look at it, and I'm, I'll just skip it. And this one is one base. So when we have a position, uh, 400,601, it's exactly this position on genome. It's not uh, shifted by one. And the last one is bad graph. It's exactly like bad, but it gives you some, some number. It has some, some extra number here. Uh, so now we're coming to analysis. So now we have our alignments. We generated our files to be visualized. So what kind of what kind of questions we can ask? And I would like that also you guys uh, actively participate in, the, in this part. What questions we can ask? <coughs> and like I put, I put some, some possible scenarios. So we have single epigenome analysis, and it could be all these six popular histone modifications which Martin introduced to you, and I just, I just uh, uh, showed you the screenshot. And we can ask the question, find enriched regions. Let's, in a few slides later, we will talk what are enriched regions, how to, because that's an interesting concept. So it's kind of de novo, right? We, we have a data, and we will data mine our data set, find locations which are different from other locations. This is one thing. We don't <coughs> have any biases prior our analysis. The second one, we already know something. We would like to look at the regions of interest. And what could be example of region of interest? It could be gene body. We only would like to see whether transcription factor, or for example, we only would like to see whether transcription factor A binds in the first intron of all coding genes in a human genome. Then we don't need to look at the entire Entire, entire genome, we just look at these regions and uh, comparing those introns which have signal comparing to those introns which don't. It's a little bit easier task, right? A little bit guided task. Uh, it could be also histone modification, flunking, some repeats, etc. This is the second scenario. So when we are not doing de novo, we already know where to look. And tomorrow you will be hearing about uh, uh, DNA methylation, and DNA methylation has its own chip seq uh, technology. Maybe you heard about MADIP or HMADIP, hydroxymethylation or methylation. So it's basically chip seq with antibody sensitive to methylated CPGs. And this chip seq analysis differs from any other chip seq analysis strongly because we know where to look there. Right? So in any other chip seq analysis, we kind of de novo. We would like to explore the entire genome. In MEDIP, we know where CPGs are. So that's a big difference there. So now, the third scenario. What would be the third scenario of analysis when we have several conditions for the same cell type, or we have several tissues, and we'd like to compare them? So that's what came to my mind, and maybe you have something else. Please raise your arm. and. Raise your, raise your hand, sorry, and uh, suggest something. I, I don't know. Maybe later we can, we can talk about this. So now, uh, this is something bothers me, and literature is kind of softly avoids to answer often, softly avoids the question, what, is enriched, what are enriched regions? How we define it? It's very intuitive. But when we would like to formulate, because when we do analysis, it's at the end is computer science or math, right? We have to um, we have to run certain tools and do some analytical uh, analytical studies. So we have to be very precise what we are doing. And 
the best what I can come up is the following. There are two criteria for a rich man, for a region to be enriched. The first that in our chip seek experiment, this region is different from other regions, which would be not enriched. S sounds like I don't know. But that's that's actually that's it. So the, most of the genome probably is not enriched, and some locations are different. So now, if we have histone modifications, and there are some, which actually most of the genome enriched, so probably in this case, experiment would be looking for anti-enriched or not enriched areas, right? Because most of the genome is enriched. This is the first criterion. The second criteria is that we, would, we typically, in modern experiments, we always have controls. In early days, people run chip-seq experiments without controls. But now we have a neg a negative control, which is again very often DNA input. Uh, there is debate. There are some other type of controls, but DNA input is the easiest one and kind of follows the whole the whole way for the library construction and everything. So except the IP step, and when we have a negative control, we would like that this is this enriched regions are not special in the negative control. So they're special in IP, but not special in the negative control. And essentially, these are only two criteria we can apply. The rest is heuristic, how we are doing this. But these are two global criteria. So we have statistically significant locations which are different from other locations and not different in, in, the, in the input. Um, now about negative control, so here is a reference for you. People discussing that, for example, uh, a cheap seek experiment with histone, so the antibody grown to the entire histone 3 is a good control, and I agree, but this is more difficult experiment, so typically input is, is our control. Now, uh, why input is important? This is a good, a good example for you, so we already did those, we generated those files, those coverage files in the big format, we visualize them in the browser, and all of a sudden, we see this picture. Of course, we see six marks, input control, transcription factor experiments, and we always have the same, the same type of coverage. We would be a little bit suspicious, but imagine we don't have luxury to have all these six marks. We only have one mark. Now, <coughs> just imagine we have just one truck. It's perfect, perfect enrichment. So apparently it's not, and input control helps us, right? When we look at the black, black truck, which is input control, we can see that there is a huge enrichment in the input control, and it violates our requirements that this location is not special in the input, in the input control. So we will blacklist or exclude those locations. And that's how we use, that's the first step where we use, we, we use input. And they, they're not uh, that, uh, that harmless, those locations, because there may be not that many. Typically, why, they, why we have this, uh, this situation, this phenomena, it's due to alignment artifact. Uh, to give you an example, we have a tandem duplication in, in the genome, which is not captured in the reference genome. And then we have much more reads in actual, in actual library, then we have uh, sequence in the genome. And those reads are coming to the same spot, although they're technically coming from the same place in the actual DNA, in the, in the actual chromatin, but they aligned in the same spot uniquely, no problem. And they're not, too, not, mul not multiplicated. Uh, this is one example. And so they basically they're technical. How many you would expect? It's about 1,000, 5,000. Uh, genome wide, but what is dangerous about those spots? That they will be the same, the same, the same for different experiments. So if we don't do this filtering using input, then we will discover concordance for those locations between different experiments, different experiments, and this is probably not what, what we would like to do. So those regions are good to uh, good to remove, and this is another example. So it was H1. This is mouse embryonic uh, stem cells. Another mark, H3K9, ME2, different conditions, input. You see perfect, huge tower. Will be huge, nice enrichment, but has to be removed. 
So here I give you just the entire chromosome one, example of entire chromosome one, human genome, and those red. So this is a coverage. On the y-axis, it shows coverage. On the x-axis, uh, position on the chromosome one. And three different cell types. So it's uh, colon, mammary gland, and thyroid, thyroid cells. And you can see that it's pretty consistent. So there are some locations near centromeres, which are always gives us huge towers. So the coverage is much higher than, than average coverage. Average coverage is perfect flat. This is log scale, so, but nevertheless, it's, it's perfect flat. However, as we see, there are some locations which are cell type specific. So for example, here we see location which is, uh, should be blacklisted in colon, but in other, like this one, in other cell types it is not present. Uh, here we have location present in colon and mammary and almost not present in thyroid, etc. So that's why it's one of the uh, pro to use input for every cell type. So its input is done parallel to your IP. Luckily, we have typically for epigenome, so classical epigenome now, at least for roadmap was and for for IHEC consortium is. Uh, six different histone modifications, we, you, we need only one input. But it's, it's, it looks like that it's a little bit cell type specific or donor specific. So. Yeah, here it's another example. So in principle, in the old days, uh, NCODE published a uh, blacklisting re, uh, re, uh, list, list of regions which has to be blacklisted, both from human and mouse. Uh, however, it doesn't cover everything. So the blue Blue dots there is what was blacklisted, but you can you can see that there are some red, red things which have survived, and in some locations, in our cells we have perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, normal coverage and in cortical blacklist because it was based on the shorter reads and the single end reads, a different technology. We can resolve those alignment artifacts better now. So, um, if you have any questions to this part, please ask. Maybe. Because now we're going to enrichment detection. Yes. I'm not interested in those locations which enriched in both. Yeah. Then it will include those artifactual locations as well. So you're only interested on, so you would expect uh, those artifactual locations the same. And therefore, if you are looking at the difference, it, yes, it will cancel out. However, uh, not, not recommended. First of all, input is used in many tools for other purposes. There's only one purpose, we are coming to this. Second, when you have this huge, huge coverage, this coverage is 10,000 in those spurious locations, you have fluctuations. And say if your cancer sample, you have coverage 5,000, and in your normal uh, sample, you have coverage 15,000, your differential analysis tool can detect the difference. Although this difference will be just due to fluctuations. They both are super enriched. It depends. It's po I think it's kind of possible to get away if you have, yeah, you can, if, and the only thing that you will never be able to ask the absolute question. Say, forget about uh, my cancer sample. I would like only enriched regions in a normal skin. <coughs> you would not be able to uh, ask this question without input. Yes. OK, we have probably 20 minutes left, so I I think I think we have enough time to talk about the something about enrichment. Uh, maybe I skip skip this. Uh, I just wanted to mention that in terms of peak calling tools, there are very very many. Uh, it's a whole people trying to use different tools, and it's it's still in our view somewhat open open area. Although many tools are published tools published on different principles. And like just to give you an idea, they're different. So some tools have explicit assumption about the background, analytical form of the background. 
Because the major problem of enrichment cooling, given those principles, our principles, water enrichment, that we don't we don't know the background. We don't know to what to expect. That's why I think this type of experiments are even more complicated than any other kind of experiments like RNA seq, etc. Because we absolutely don't know, and we are at the mercy of quality of antibody, uh, many, many, many things. So what is the noise? What is the background in our in our uh, it depends whether your cells were frozen or fresh. Many, many factors will affect it. And we don't know analytical, yes? Are there like review articles that can tell you what are the different tools and their assumptions? And, uh... Uh, there are some. Uh, typically, people are comparing different tools. Uh, typically, every publication, at least last publications, last few years, uh, they have to compare to existing tools, and they they like giving. From but from the user perspective, you know, rather than trying to figure out what all all the tools are and what is kind of the, the pros and cons <laughs> of each. Okay. That's a very difficult question. Yes, uh, I mean, from the user perspective, there are many, many, many requirements. Like sometimes you download the tool. Sometimes tools are written in a very exotic language. You try to run it, you don't have your system, the system didn't install this environment for you, you don't know how to run it. Many tools, you download them, they're not supported. They were published a few years ago, they're not supported. They're not, they don't run. And I, I was there many times that I can't run it, so then you contact authors and you start. Is there some sort of group that tries to like, you know, uh, organize these tools and you know, discard the ones that are redundant? And well, I think we we try, like, and not not discard. I mean, this is not. Uh, well, first of all, people took a lot of effort to to write those tools, and people sincerely found the best heuristics for the data at their hands at this very moment. So, in every publication, you would see that my tool performs much better than tool A, B, C available before. But this was done only on this particular data set on those set of parameters which were tuned for this particular data set. This is unfortunately, that's the way how we're doing. We're a little bit overfeeding things. Um, yeah, visualize the data, run some tool, visualize the data, see how happy. I, if I will have time, I hope I will have time, I would like to introduce to you some approaches which are not using any cheap uh, peak calling and can answer some questions uh, without peak calling. But still, back to peak call. So what, what people are trying to do is the following, is to try to use some analytical shape for the background. And of course, we are dealing with count data. So Poisson or Poisson-like uh, 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 distributions might work. And sure enough, for some libraries, it's perfect. So the input control will be fit by Poisson perfect. And then you get another library, you try to fit with Poisson, Oops, you see that it's not. Then you say, well, maybe it's negative binomial, which is slight extension of Poisson. Poisson has just one parameter, mean. That's it. Negative binomial has two parameters. And you have more degrees of freedom you can fit. But then you have another library you can't fit with negative binomial. So unfortunately, cheap seek experiments have lots of biases, which are not of statistical origin. So probably there is no unique statistical an analytical distribution for the background. And there are, uh, there are many heuristics. There is supervised learning uh, approach. There, there are many, many approaches. Uh, and it's, we're developing our own tool as well, which is kind of parameter free, which is not assumption free. But it's, 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 a, little bit, it's a little bit of banging the ball experiment. Uh, banging the wall experience for us at the moment, but we kind of you move you move uh, five inches forward and then four and a half backwards with this type of so, but still half an inch, yeah. So now uh, when we analyze our cheap seek cheap seek data, uh, we can see that there are different kinds of marks. They they some some maybe you heard about this uh, that there are narrow narrow marks and broad marks probably. Some of you heard about those. And this is just appearance of the mark. 
So one mark is Marky Pearson. If I come back to this slide, oops, this slide. So there are some marks which appears like a punctated peaks, and there are some marks which appears as a broad covered regions. And it's just the nature of the enzymes which are uh, uh, loading those, uh, setting those marks. Although even those peaks for histone modifications, they're typically tens of nucleosomes. It's not a single nucleosome. It's very hard to imagine real enrichment happen on one nucleosome. So there are multiple nucleosomes. And here, here I give you, give you examples. Uh, this one, the red one is hck 4 me 3 and it is about 3 kb. And the purple one is hck 36 me 3 which is typically a histone modification associated with elongation, transcriptional elongation. And it appears in gene bodies. And it, it, in this particular example, it's 100 kb region. So this kind of zoology is there. And that's detail of the 3 kb peak. You can see that when you zoom in, there's actually multiple peaks. There's kind of a fork there. And that kind of addresses your question, what tool to use. And uh, this is difficult, uh, difficult question. And very often, people just use what, what one can run. And looking at the data, whether, it's, whether it makes sense. So that's. But then doesn't it bias the results? Yes, I, I agree. I agree. That's in my opinion, it is to some extent open area, and uh, there is lots of. If you really want to be very very careful with your data, you can do many things without using tools and to do a lot of QC, not QC at the read level, but QC at your biology level. That what you are doing is is correct. Uh, so and now what I would like to spend the remaining time is to introduce you to some approaches which is prior to enrichment detector, what we can do. We can actually learn a lot from the data without doing any peak calling. And uh, so will be single data example, an example for mouse embryonic uh, cells. And we will be looking at the region of interest, regions of interest, and our regions of interest will be promoters of coding genes. And of course, how to define promoters, that's a question. Here we define it as a region, TSS plus minus 1.5 KB. And we only take the major transcripts. We are not talking about alternative promoters. We are talking about major transcripts. And th th then what we we're going to do is we compare the signal. We calculate the coverage of the signal in those uh, promoters. <coughs> to 3 KB regions genome-wide. So it's OK, right? It's clear what, what we are going to do. We take these profiles, these weak files. We calculate the integral, the signal. Maybe next, next slide, I'll explain it. So we, that's, our, that's our marks. So here is our profiles. And this is a gene, in particular gene. And here's promoter. In this particular case, is plus minus 1.5 KB. What we do, we take the integral. We sum, uh, we calculate the area under the curve for all those trucks, and this will be our signal. Then we do the same for every 3 KB bean in the entire human genome. So it's quite a few of those beans, right? 3 billion bases divided by 3 KB. It's, it's um, 10. Uh, it's 1 million, yes, a little bit less than that, because some of it is unmappable. Uh, and then we compare. Then we compare distributions. And the very first one, that's a plot when we take input DNA, and we do this in promoters and genome-wide. And what this plot shows us, it's a histogram. So every on, in X, on x-axis, there is a mean coverage. So we take the integral, we take the area under the curve, divided by the length, 3 kb. This is the mean coverage. And on the y-axis, that's the frequency. So how many beans out of the total number of beans uh, have this, this mean signal? And it's normalized. It's normalized by, because we have different number. We have only about 20,000 promoters and much more genomic beans. And you can see that it's, it's not bad. So it tells us, what, what, what this plot tells us right away? 
region is not. So, that's right. That's right. So in input DNA, our promoters look exactly as everywhere in the genome, which is, which is good, which is already resolved, actually, in my, in my view. So, so now we do the second, the second plot. We do the same for CK4ME3. And this is a red, red or orange curve, while the blue curve is genomic beans. So as you expect, genomic beans for HTK4 industry is kind of falling. So it's background. So we expect zero. It's if our antibody would be absolutely perfectly specific, then we will have zero reads uh, everywhere except we have the modification. <coughs> and we know that this modification marks, it's kind of linked to transcriptional activity. It marks transcriptionally active genes. So only in the promoters of the transcriptionally active genes you'll find. However, our, our antibody is not perfect, and we have this falling blue curve. And what is remarkable is that for the, some of the promoters, red curve follows exactly the blue curves. So it means that some of our genes are not active, our promoters are not marked, and uh, the curve looks uh, like genome-wide curve. But then we have this nice, nice peak. So it means that the mean coverage is about 30, right here, somewhere here in this, in this peak. And we can do a very simple experiment. We visually, we look at this plot, we say, so everything above 8 or 10 is enrichment. Everything below this is not enrichment. And we right away get a list of genes which marked by this histone modification. And the next step we can, so of course it's, I'm not recommending this as a analysis, final analysis, but if we want within one hour or two hours or few few hours, one day, to get a result which we could, would like to look at and see whether data makes sense, this is a good way to do. Or nothing wrong with this, with this way to do, with this the way to do analysis. And this data is not particularly, so it's a good data, but it's not star. So it's not that I selected something which is like really, really good, very, very clean. No, this data is normal, normal data. So the next, the next will be for another uh, histone modification, HCK9ME3. And maybe some of you are familiar with this modification. It's a very well, um, people who work with repetitive <coughs> regions, very well familiar with this mark because uh, this is a repressive mark and it is linked to hetero, hetero, uh, heterochromatin, sorry, and it represses uh, retroviruses in mammalian genomes. So what we can say, so again, the blue curve is genome-wide and the red curve is promoters. We can probably say that promoters, we're not interested. If we're looking, if we're only interested in promoters of the genes, this mark is not that important because this mark is kind of anti-enriched. So our peak is below the genome-wide average. Are you with me? It's, it's kind of almost obvious. However, you can say, well, this is genome-wide average. So in genome, we will have something, some locations which are not marked at all. And then there is some genome-wide uh, average, probably background. And then there is a tail. So there's some genome-wide locations. And then there are some promoters, which also have large signal. And true, there is a handful of genes, maybe 30 genes, 30 or 50 genes, which are germline-specific genes, which have this modification in their promoter. But those are much less, uh, this modification is much less abundant in promoters and other modifications. Then the next mark, again repressive mark, hck 27 me 3 We do exactly the same, exactly the same plotting. So what we see here? On the first look, it's anti-enriched. So majority of promoters have very little signal of this because this is genome-wide. genome, genome -wide. However, you can immediately see that there is a long tail. So there are some promoters out of 20,000, maybe 10%, which have this modification. And again, somewhere here, we can put, put a threshold and decide which, uh, which, mark is, uh, which promoter is marked and which is not. And here's another look. It's exactly the same data. I plot 
a heat map of one, so it's all pro, every dot here is a promoter, a single promoter, and on y-axis is HCK27 ME3 mark, and on x-axis is HCK4 ME3 mark. What we can see here immediately that those marks are anti-correlating. So everybody, everybody sees this, right? So it's kind of that we have, we either have the bright color means a lot of promoters. So a lot of promoters have, uh, have uh, zero uh, HCK4 ME3 and some signal in HCK27 ME3, so along this li line. And a lot of promoters opposite have a strong K4 ME3 signal and very weak K27 ME3 signal. So the most of them are mutually exclusive. But there is a class of promoters here which have strong signal or kind of intermediate strength signal for both of the marks. And maybe you heard about bivalent promoters, and those are promoters which are co-marked. The mechanism of this co-marking is debated. It can be cell heterogeneity or it can be true bivalency. But uh, at least in the experiment, the way what we see in this particular experiment is only we can count promoters which have both marks. And just looking at this plot, I just draw by hand, effectively, two lines. And I said, everything which is here is K27 ME3, no K4 ME3. Everything here is K4 ME3, no K27 ME3. And everything in this middle quadrant is, uh, uh, is bivalency. And by doing this, I can correlate my marks with expression. I just done, done this, and then I would like to see what expression, because I know what to expect, right? I know that those genes which are marked with don't, is essentially which are repressed by K27 ME3, by polycomb complex, they're not expressed or lowly expressed, and K4 ME3 alone should be highly expressed. So if you look at the lower, lower box plots, so here is HCK4 ME3 alone, and on the bottom is log 10 of RPKM. And RPKM stands for read per kilobase per million. That's a, an expression metric. And you can see that for HCK4 ME3 alone, we have much higher expression. That's a log scale, right? So it's from here to here, there is like 1,000 times difference. So K27 alone is very low expression, not mark by both is almost like K27 alone, and bivalent is in the middle. And here I plot both embryonic stem cell, H1, and uh, breast uh, myoepithelial basal cells. And you can see that the pattern is slightly different, that, uh, for example, uh, not marked uh, here and here is, are, are different. And then when we look at this, this is a distribution, but if you look at the number of, number of uh, a uh, uh, number of promoters uh, in my epithelial, we have much more promoters which mark by HCK27 ME3 uh, exclusively, while in H1, we mostly have bivalent promoters. And it's known phenomena is considered that due, uh, why, uh, during differentiation, those bivalent promoters are resolved in either repressed or active. So there is a, they lose their bivalency and they resolved. And just one sec, I fin finish this and then answer your question. So and the, on the top is uh, is actually the it's basically what what I just said the normalized HCK27 ME3 signal versus expression. I separate highly expressed genes and low expressed genes, and why in embryonic stem cells it's almost the same. So in high and low, so the mark K27 is is, is the same, but in my epithelial those genes which are, have low expression, have high, uh, much stronger HCK27 ME3 signal. They are repressed. So how are you like trying to get all the genes which are not expressed in the body? That's a good question. Of course, I need to have some, some name for my promoter. And this is like gene ID, for example. Yes. So I keep gene ID for every promoter, and I have gene ID for every expression. And then I just join those files. Okay, so you have basically like RNA seq and chip seq. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have RNA seq prediction, RPKM for every gene labeled by gene ID. And for every promoter, I have labeled uh, every promoter is labeled by gene ID. And then 
just diagnostically, I just calculate those signals and without, without doing any sophisticated analysis, we can learn something. So here, just an example that we can orthogonally look at our data. So instead of calculating signal for every individual promoter, we can look at the coverage around TSS and agglomerate those coverages genome-wide. So we just draw, so make sure draw, it, draw it on, on the board. So we have, we have our genome and we have genes here, here, genome opposite strand, this way. And then, for example, we have HTK4 and H3 mark, which will be marked this way, marked this way, and here we have marked this way. It happens that all three genes have the mark. Then I take the region, plus minus 1.5 kb here, 1.5 kb here, 1.5 kb here, and agglomerate them into one combined profile throw them in the same 3KB ruler, all of them, and do it genome-wide. And then I compare. I, I, this is a good metric to see how mark looks like globally. Right? And uh, this is a good way to compare different marks, how mark behaves near transcription start site. And maybe like five, seven years ago, this type of plot would be publicable. Now publishable, now it's not, obviously, but it's very easy to, to generate, but it's not novel in, at all, but a few years ago it was, yeah, the whole. So you can, you can see that H3K4ME3 has this very specific profile around TSS. It has a deep, it's, it has a nucleosome-free region around TSS, and it has a deep here, while like K36ME3, which typically covers uh, gene body, only starts, and you can also see relationship to input. This just give you give you an idea. This all can be done can be done using those profiles, big files. And um, so, just an example again of the raw signal without any any peak peak calling. Uh, we calculated HTK27 ME3 raw signal in the promoter. And we have, I think here is about 40 plus different cell types. And we just did the hierarchical clustering. You're familiar with unsupervised hierarchical clustering. We just try to be, generate a vector for all, um, for all genes. In, in this particular case, it's all coding genes. So it will be vector of a size 20,000. And we have those vector for every human cells here. We have many cells, they're all from NIH Roadmap project. And then we start looking at the, at the clustering of the, in, the, in this space. And what you can see is that actually our cells are clustering according to biology. We did nothing. We just calculated the raw signal. You can even count reads in the promoter after your alignment. We did nothing sophisticated, but the old brain cells are coming together, all blood cells are coming together. H1 and derived cells coming together, as well as IPS cells. So that's that's an example of um, at least you can consider this as a good QC because you've done it and you can state that your data look right. So here is uh, I'm talking about already peak callers. This is a tool which we are developing, which is called Finder. Maybe we talk a little bit more about it uh, in the practicum. I think. My time is up, so I have to uh, finish uh, soon. Some details on Finder. This is the version one. Now we have version two, which we are hope, hoping to finish soon and publish. And then there is Max tool. Uh, there are many, many tools, as we said, available. And I only will present here Max. Uh, there are multiple reasons. There are actually two major reasons why Max. First of all, if you PubMed Max, Max two, it, you will get like 2,000 hits. So this tool was cited in the literature enormous amount of time. The second reason, and it, so it does a job roughly, although it's kind of more and more people are aware in the field, people are aware that the behavior of the tool is sometimes odd. But nevertheless, it roughly does a job, especially in the older days when the 
accuracy of the libraries were not that great. And the second, that you can run it. You can download the tool and run it, no problem. So that's, that's one of the things. So what are the principles behind Max? Very, very quickly, is uh, the principle is Poisson, Poisson background, as, as uh, assumption of Poisson background. It, it needs input, or it can run is in input-free mode as well. So basically, it finds a fragment length. It's designed for a single end. And for pair end, it's also kind of mimicking single end mode. It determined fragment lengths. It shifted reads towards to each other, positive and negative, uh, negative um, strands. It calculates number of reads in every bean. So if in every specific location, 200 base pair beans, calculates count of reads. And then looks around this. 1,000 bases around, 10,000 bases around, and genome wide. And assuming Poisson distribution, it calculates lambda, the single parameter of Poisson. And then it compares expected count. If it would be Poisson with this lambda, and lambda will be maximum lambda from 1 KB around the region, 10 KB around the region, and genome wide. I think I'm talking in the next slide here, yes. So you, you rather conservative. You're local, but on the other hand, you're rather conservative. And then you comparing your actual read count in the bean to your uh, your background. So that's how the tool works. And yeah, that's uh, I think that's my almost last last slide. It's uh, comparing uh, comparing two or more data set, uh, maybe a couple. Like the challenges, of course, different depths of sequencing, then we are at the mercy of normalization, different signal to noise, we are also at the mercy of normalization, different read lengths, I already mentioned this, different fragment length distribution. Even if the read length is the same, but our fragment length distribution is completely different, then our data will have some biases. And there are many, many other biases, uh, as uh, sequence specific biases. D. GC, etc. So we need somehow harmonize the data, and for any big uh, epigenomic program uh, project is a challenge how to do it. And typically, it's a loss of data. So the, you have to use the minimal determinant. You have to basically the worst data dictates you what to do. Their data with shortest read length, the, the most shallow reads. You have to subsample down, and that's yeah, that's how people do it. But there is a compromises. There are compromises and. There is no ideal, ideal, ideal solution. Uh, one of the possible solutions, which is not frequently used, but I think you can, it's like a doctor when the pediatrician has a, has a baby who got sick with some unknown disease. Typically, doctor takes a healthy baby and compare healthy and baby <coughs> who is sick. So do the same. So take one library, unambiguously call enrichment or identify enrichment in one library and then use another library as a lookup. Just, to, just do this. So you're kind of using region of interest. You define your region of interest in one library, and then you use second library to, to look up. That's an idea. And basically just to second Martin, that uh, garbage in, garbage out. So if the data, one of the wisdom we learn hard times that uh, dealing with chip seek the special, call, uh, the special care should be taken on all uh, QC steps, alignment steps, because if something went wrong and every preliminary step, then, um, then analysis step is not, not value, uh, has no value. Thank you. Thank you.